Yes. Добро вечер на сите. Ве поздравувам. А вечер во сакам да го представам професор Сен Батни кој дарежливо се понуди да одржи едно предавање ја во името на клиничката болница Ачи Батен се стигна го го представувам. А нема разборувам многу за него. А бидејќи на самите покани има на кратко што значи неговото име во светот на психологијата и очекувам и сум сигурен дека ќе имаме едно многу интересно предавање за една група на расстройства од доменот на расстройствата на личности посебна една посебна група во која се спаѓа и нацизмот и психопатијата Меѓутоа, понатаму, ќе му препуштам зборот на професор Вак. Thank you. Here's the first piece of advice. Never applaud before you get the merchandise. <laughs> first see what you're getting. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Sam Vaknin. Uh, I've had a very generous introduction. I'm not going to repeat it. I want uh, to thank, first and foremost, uh, Dr. Wautakov and Dr. Dimova from Sistina for organizing this event. And I want to thank Sistina as a hospital for the wonderful and professional treatment that my wife has received here. And this is my way of saying thank you for being who you are. Thank you very much. I teach in uh, Cambridge, United Kingdom, and in other universities. Um, and those of you who can't get enough of my face, you can join my YouTube channel. Um, it's a channel dedicated to narcissism, personality disorders, psychopathy, and other wonderful topics which will make you very happy and joyful and cheerful for the rest of the day. There are 400,000 subscribers on this channel, so you're welcome to join. You will be in good company, I think. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> okay. What you're about to hear is the introductory lecture, the introduction to a one-day seminar. And this is a one-day seminar that I'm giving all over the world. I just gave a seminar in Mexico City and San Francisco and other places. This one-day seminar um, is about cluster B personality disorders, narcissists, psychopaths. Don't be alarmed. I will explain all these terms. Um, and those of you who like to travel, there is going, I'm going to give this seminar in Zagreb. In Zagreb on the 8th, on the 8th of December. I'm going to give the one-day seminar. Uh, it will be, this seminar is in Zagreb at least, it's free of charge, so it will cost you only the ticket. And if you don't like what you hear, uh, you can sue me for a refund. Okay. 1,950 years before the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, there was another book written by Jewish scholars. It's known as the New Testament. And this is what this book has to say. You see? <laughs> it's a sign from God. <laughs> Direct communication. <laughs> this is what the Bible has to say. But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, this is the Bible, not, not me, without love, 
unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, arrogant, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people, says the Bible. They are the kind who warm their way into your homes and they gain control over gullible women, which sounds like a lot of fun, who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kind of evil desires. These people are always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge and to the truth. That is by far the best description of narcissists that I know of. Much better than the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Much better than the International Classification of Diseases, the ICD. These are the two books that we use to diagnose people. Diagnosing people is a lot of fun. It's like detective work. So, in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, we have a list of nine traits. And then we compare the person sitting opposite us, the presentation. The, we compare the presentation to the list of criteria. And if the person meets five out of nine, that's a narcissist or a psychopath. Similarly, in the International Classification of Diseases, the ICD, edition 11, we have a list of traits, antagonism, dissociality. We will discuss these traits a bit later. And if someone comes to our office and they satisfy these traits, we say that they are possibly narcissists or psychopaths, although the ICD does not use these words. I want you to, to know. Narcissists and psychopaths are terms that are used almost exclusively in North America, in the United States, in Canada, to some extent in the United Kingdom, some parts of Australia. The ICD does not contain this diagnosis. There's no diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder in ICD. So, the lecture is divided in two parts, like everything Jewish. The first one is, the first part is phenomenology. I'm going to describe to you the typical narcissist. The second part is etiology. And the etiology part is actually much more interesting, at least to me. Because the question arises, how come such a human being is, is formed? What creates such a person? And you know, when I say human beings, human being, by the way, you can hear me well to the very end? Yeah, yeah. My, my apologies, my condolences. So when I use the word human being, in this particular context, I'm, be, I'm a bit careful. Because as you will see, narcissists lack critical features of what constitutes a human being. Narcissists, for example, have no emotional empathy. Narcissists have no access to positive emotions, such as love. They never experience positive emotions, only negative ones. So, if you begin to remove one layer after another, the question arises, what is left? And in which sense is the narcissist a full-fledged human? Is it a human being? I know this is not the way a professor of psychology should talk. It's politically incorrect. You should not say such things about people or you will lose your job. Well, with you I'm, a, I'm being a bit more open and a bit more honest, I think. There is a serious problem in perceiving and conceiving of narcissists and psychopaths as human, as you will see, especially psychopaths. Now, the question in the second part, the etiology, and I'm keeping the good part to the end so that you don't leave the room. Yeah? The second part deals with the way the narcissist is formed. What creates 
because a narcissist is a child. Is, is, narcissists are born exactly like non-narcissists. <laughs> They're babies. What happens to this kind of baby? What, what transforms the baby into a narcissist later in life? And this is the etiology. This is the process. And you're going to hear things, this is the latest in research, the cutting edge in research, you're going to hear things that defy belief and defy imagination. The things that I'm going to tell you sound utterly fantastic, surrealistic, stolen from some horror movie or sci-fi movie, yet they're all real. They're all substantiated by research and numerous studies over 120 years. Psychopathy has been first described 200 years ago. Sadism, 140 years ago. Narcissism, exactly 110 years ago. These are the oldest known mental health disorders. Even schizophrenia and so on was described much later. These are the oldest known, and we have enormous mountain ranges of literature about these disorders in every conceivable country and a few non-conceivable countries. And we know almost everything there is to know, at least phenomenologically, the etiology is evolving, as you will see. So let's first talk about the profile of the narcissist, and then get rid of this boring part and go into the real fun, the real exciting terrain, which is the transformation of a newborn baby into essentially someone who is widely perceived, for better or for worse, as a monster. Start with the profile. There are two books, there are two diagnostic manuals in the world. One of them is known as a DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And one of them is known as the ICD, the International Classification of Diseases, published by the World Health Organization. The ICD and the DSM disagree massively about literally everything. <laughs> the ICD, for example, is dimensional. In other words, it, the ICD deals with spectra, spectrum or continuum. So in the ICD, we have mild disorders, moderate disorders, severe disorders. We don't have this in the DSM. The DSM is categorical. Either you have the disorder or you don't have the disorder. It's like pregnancy. The traits, the traits of narcissism and the traits of psychopathy are on a continuum. They are on a spectrum. You can be less empathic, less, less empathic, not empathic. I mean, there's, it's a spectrum. It's a continuum. But the disorders themselves are binary. Yes or no situations in the DSM, a spectrum and a continuum in the ICD. And this is not where the disagreement stops. <laughs> For example, the ICD is much more advanced than the DSM in terms of thinking about personality disorders. In the ICD, there's only one personality disorder, a diagnosis of personality disorder. And then each person, each patient, each client, call it as you wish, <laughs> presents with this personality disorder with some emphasis. So we could have, for example, someone diagnosed with personality disorder with narcissistic emphasis. It's not called narcissistic, it's called dissocial, with dissocial emphasis. Or we can have someone with personality disorder with emotional dysregulation emphasis. This is someone who is overwhelmed by emotions. The emotions drown the person. The person cannot control the emotions. And this is called dysregulation, and it leads to behavioral manifestations, which we'll, we'll not discuss today. <laughs> so, in the ICD, there's a single diagnosis. In the DSM, there are 12. 12 diagnoses. Consequently, those who use the DSM end up diagnosing multiple personality disorders in the same person, a phenomenon known as comorbidity. So if you go to a psychiatrist or a psychologist in the United States, you will leave the, the consulting room with three, four, five diagnoses. 
borderline, narcissist, psychopath, mood disorder, <laughs> and so on and so forth. It's very typical to have three, three to five diagnoses. And this is known as comorbidity. When you go in Europe, the situation is much better usually. Usually, not always, but usually. So what, are the, what is the profile? If we put together the DSM and the ICD, what kind of profile do we come up with? And remember, the narcissist and the psychopath are alien to people who are healthy. There is no common denominator. It's a common mistake to believe that the narcissist and the psychopath are exaggerations of healthy people. It's like we take a healthy person, we make a caricature or an exaggeration, and that's the narcissist and the psychopath. Wrong. That is not true. That what is true is that there is very little in common between narcissists and psychopaths and normal, healthy, regulated, relatively speaking, people. If you can find people like that <laughs> nowadays. The first thing, of course, which everyone will tell you, is that narcissists and psychopaths don't have empathy. By the way, on the screen, you can read the definitions of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Now, a very interesting piece of gossip, because what is a lecture without gossip? It's boring. It's a very interesting piece of gossip. There was a huge fight in the committee that wrote the latest edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, edition 5. There was a huge fight. There was a group of scholars that wanted to eliminate narcissistic personality disorder, to delete it. And there was another group that wanted to uh, describe it in a different way, rewrite the diagnostic criteria. So what happens, in the DSM, you have two possibilities, two, two lists, two descriptions of narcissism. And you can choose, and they are not the same. They are not compatible. Imagine that you, as medical doctors, have two descriptions of tuberculosis. And these descriptions have nothing to do with each other. I don't think you would feel very comfortable. This is known as the polythetic problem. We'll leave it alone for a minute. So, in the DSM, you find one description, which is a list of nine criteria, and another description, which is known as the alternative model, page 881, for those of you who have copies of the DSM. And this alternative model is totally different to the list. It's not the same. So what I did to help all of us survive this lecture is I took the text of the DSM, the two texts of the DSM. I combined it with the text of the ICD. And what you see here is a merger of the DSM alternative model with the ICD combined. Okay? You can read, I will not read it for you, but you can read on the screen the description under each of the points. What I will do, I will tell you, I will give you uh, access, I will give you insight to the clinical presentation of these, of these traits. These are all known as trait domains. These are traits of the narcissist. We start with lack of empathy. Until very recently, there was a serious mistake in the literature and among scholars. They said that narcissists and psychopaths don't have empathy at all. They're unable to empathize with people. Now, for those of you who need a definition of empathy, which is not a good sign, those of you who need a definition, empathy is the ability to put yourself in other people's shoes to see their point of view and then react to this insight emotionally. It's not enough to understand someone. It's not enough to put yourself in someone else's shoes. It's not enough to say, oh, she's sad, he's happy. It's to feel it. The word empathy was first coined, believe it or not, by a German. A German came up with this word. And in German, it is Einfühlung. Einfühlung. 
feeling together, feeling like a sing single feeling. <laughs> and the German who came up with this word, long dead by now, um, said that when we look at a painting, when we look at a painting, we resonate with the painting. painting. The painting or piece of music or piece of art create in us, these pieces of art create in us emotions. So he said, when you look at a painting, you have Einfühlung with the painting. You, your feelings resonate. And this became empathy. Because someone took this idea and said, wait a minute, why only painting? When we look at other people, we have also emotional reactions. And this is how empathy was born. In Germany, of all places. Which proves to you that history is unpredictable. So, um, today we know that narcissists and psychopaths do possess empathy. It is not true that they don't have empathy. This you will find in older textbooks, <laughs> other places. But today, the cutting edge, I'm going to give you the recent advances. The cutting edge is they do have empathy. But they have a special kind of empathy. I, co I coined the phrase called empathy. It's combination of cognitive empathy and reflexive empathy, but no emotional empathy. Let me explain. A baby is born. Baby looks at mommy. Mommy smiles, baby smiles. Back. If it's a normal baby, <laughs> smiles back. This is reflexive empathy. It's a reflex. Similarly, the baby grows, becomes a toddler, infant, toddler, and child. And baby begins to re a child begins to realize that other people experience emotions or affects that are similar to him, to the child. So the child says, uh, she is crying. When I'm crying, I'm sad. So she must be sad. It's a deductive process. It's a syllogism. So this is cognitive empathy. Okay? Emotional empathy is when the child becomes sad because someone else is sad. This is where psychopaths and narcissists stop. Psychopaths and narcissists fully, fully decipher and decode and understand your emotions. Fully. Even more than usual. Even more than normal. They're able to, the psychopath and the narcissist is able to scan you, scan you, and immediately find out your weak points, your vulnerabilities, your fears, the chinks in your armor, penetration vectors. So this is the scanning process of the narcissist and psychopath, which uses empathy, of course. And then there's no emotional reaction. The psychopath would see a woman crying. Okay. A healthy person would see a per another person, a woman. Let's take a woman because it's uh, very sexist. So he would see a woman crying. A healthy man would see a woman crying. He would say, oh, she's crying. She's probably sad. I feel sad. Let me try to alleviate her sadness. Maybe it will help my sadness as well. Let, let's try to be happy together. And he will talk to her, will calm her, and so on. A psychopath would see the same woman crying. And he would say, oh, she's crying. So she's fragile. She's vulnerable. I can have sex with her. A narcissist would see a woman crying. And he would say, there are two possibilities. If she agrees to get my help, if she agrees for me to become the savior, the rescuer, then she is interesting because she could become a source of attention and admiration. She will let me save her. She will let me help her. She will let me rescue her. And so this makes me big. This makes me, that's one option. The second option, a narcissist can say, She's crying too much. It's too much work. She will not be able to give me attention or admiration or adulation. And so she's not interesting. And he would just walk away. That's the difference between healthy people and narcissists and psychopaths. And this is known as uh, cold empathy or cognitive reflexive empathy. No emotional resonance. No emotional reaction whatsoever. The reason is that narcissists are unable to access positive emotions, and psychopaths do not have any display of emotions. This is called reduced affect display. They don't display affect. 
So we believe that they don't experience emotions at all. We'll come to it a bit later when we discuss fear and, and so on. The next thing is fear of intimacy. What is to be intimate? When you're intimate with someone, what is it? It's to expose your vulnerabilities. You're weak when you're intimate with someone. Intimate is weakness by definition. Because the other person knows your weak points, your failures, your flaws, your vulnerabilities, and you trust the other person not to abuse this knowledge, not to make bad, bad uses of the knowledge, not to leverage the knowledge to manipulate you, to hurt you, and so on. So intimacy involves two elements. It involves uh, trust, trusting the other party, and it involves vulnerability, signaling of vulnerability, sharing of vulnerability. Narcissists are incapable of both because the narcissist is not vulnerable. He is not weak. He is perfect. The narcissist is perfect. He is godlike. I mean, just look at me. He is godlike. So, this uh, conflicts with intimacy. Because if you're godlike, you have no shortcomings, you have no flaws, you have no vulnerabilities, nothing. You have nothing to share. And you have nothing to... You, 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 you cannot become naked in the metaphorical sense. That's the first point. And trust is a major issue with narcissists. Narcissists have paranoid ideation. They assume the worst. They are suspicious and they are hypervigilant. Why are narcissists so paranoid? Why are they so suspicious? Why are they hypervigilant? Hypervigilance is when you constantly listen. Is someone insulting me? Is someone attacking me? Is someone planning something bad to do to me? Is someone conspiring against me? This is hypervigilance. So why, why are narcissists like this? Because they are very fragile. It's easy to break the narcissist. Actually, narcissists are very vulnerable, as we will see a bit later in the etiology part. So they cannot afford to trust anyone. Because if they trust someone, that person has power. That person has power to challenge their self-perception as God. The narcissist firmly believes that he is godlike, that he is a perfect entity. And so if you challenge this, normally you challenge this. You cannot live together with someone or have a relationship or be a colleague of someone or, and not from time to time disagree, criticize, suggest something. If you suggest something to the narcissist, if you're trying to give advice, if you're trying to offer help, it's an insult. <laughs> because who are you to help me? I'm God. Who are you to suggest anything to me? I'm God. Who are you to... Give me help. I don't need help. I don't need to learn anything. Narcissists never learn. I don't need to learn anything because I encompass all, all human knowledge. I am God in the fullest sense of the word. So, as you see, intimacy is impossible under these circumstances. The next element is what we call diffuse or disturbed identity. Identity diffusion, identity disturbance. This is common, this is common to narcissists. It's very prono pronounced in borderline personality disorder. It's a, it's a major feature of borderline personality disorder and even in psychopathy. It is the inability to have a core an identity which never changes, or rarely changes. It's a lack of sense of self. Today, the narcissist believes something. The next day, he believes something else. Today, he has these and these values. The next day, he has the opposite values. Today, he's a Democrat. Tomorrow, he's Republican. Today, he supports abortion. The next day, he is the President of the United States. So. There's identity disturbance, identity diffusion, in the sense 
that there is no functioning self. There's nobody there, actually. We'll come to it in the etiology. The big discovery since the 1960s is that the narcissist is not a presence. He is an absence. It's a black hole. That's the metaphor that we are using nowadays. It's a black hole. We'll come to it a bit later. So, lack of identity. Lack of stable identity across time and across situations. That means that the narcissist is unpredictable. Unpredictable. You cannot see the next step of the narcissist because the narcissist cannot see the next step of the narcissist. There is this image, is this image that narcissists and psychopaths are evil, cunning, scheming, like, uh, professor, like uh, Moriarty, you know, Moriarty and Sherlock Holmes, yeah? That they are, but it's not true. They're very chaotic. They're very chaotic. Actually, cluster B personality disorders, the cluster that includes narcissism, psychopathy, borderline, histrionic, this cluster is known as the dramatic erratic cluster because they are, they are totally unstable, all of them, psychopaths also. They're unstable and they are not there. They are more like reflections. I call it a hive mind. There's nobody there. It's an emptiness that mirrors influences from outside. It's like a huge mirror. You can think of a narcissist like a huge mirror. And you are reflected in the mirror. And your reflections become the narcissist's identity. Your reflections, your input, your words become the narcissist's identity. So, and it's a process known as narcissistic supply. We'll discuss it in a minute. That's why it's very important for the narcissist that your input should be positive, or more clinically speaking, egosyntonic. It's very important for the narcissist that your, your input, your words, your reflections, your feedback will not contradict, will not undermine, will not challenge, and will not destroy the narcissist's self-image as God. Why is it so important to the narcissist what you are saying? Because the narcissist does not exist except in your words. It's not that the narcissist is listening to you and there is someone there who is listening to you and saying, I accept this, I reject this. It's not like that. The narcissist is the sum total of your feedback. That's why he wants to control your feedback, to make sure that there is no disaster in the making. At attention seeking behaviors, attention seeking behaviors are very important. They are common to narcissists, borderlines, to some extent psychopaths, grandiose psychopaths. But it's not attention the way you think about it. We all want attention. Everyone wants attention. You may want the attention of your spouses or your children or your colleagues or your bosses. There is no human being who doesn't want attention, of course. And the reason is very primitive, is very primordial. If as a baby you don't get attention, you're a dead baby. Attention is critical. To be seen, to be noticed is a survival strategy from age zero. So this remains with us. Imagine that there was a conspiracy here and all of you pre pretended to not see a specific individual. That individual would feel as if she is disappearing. The gaze of other people defines us. The gaze of other people gives us identity, makes us who we are, creates the boundaries and the contours, shapes us. We appear, we materialize from the gaze of other people. This is all healthy. Where it becomes pathological is when it's compulsive. There's an element of compulsion. I demand attention. And if you don't give me attention, I'm going to punish you. And it is, has to be a specific type of attention, not any kind of attention, but a specific type. It has to be an attention that supports my view of myself as God. It's the only attention I will accept. 
any other type of attention is aggression. If you give me attention that says that I'm not God, you're my enemy. You're my persecutory object. You're, I, it, it means that you're hostile to me. And it's war. This is known as antagonism. So, attention seeking in the narcissistic sense is not the same as attention seeking with healthy people. It's not about being seen only. It's about being seen my way. The narcissist wants you to see him his way. His way or the highway. And it's very easy to flip. You say the wrong thing. You, you give the wrong look. <laughs> Your body language changes. The narcissist instantaneously transitions from your best friend to your worst nightmare, to your worst enemy. And I mean instantaneously. It's so instantaneous that we have a name for it. It's called switching. And it's not only narcissists. It's also borderlines, although for different reasons. Today I'm not going to discuss borderlines, which is a fascinating topic in itself. Borderlines seek attention, but for a completely different reason. They need to regulate themselves from the outside. That's a different story. This is attention seeking, which is, in the case of the narcissist, compulsive and aggressive. Compulsive and aggressive. Many people confuse, many people confuse narcissism with grandiosity. So you find all kind, you find all kind of self-styled experts on YouTube. They say all psychopaths are narcissists, when actually what they're trying to say is that all psychopaths are grand, grandiose which is also not true. Not all psychopaths are grandiose. But okay, do not, confuse, do not confuse grandiosity with narcissism. Grandiosity is a trait. It's a trait domain. You have grandiosity in narcissists, among narcissists. You have grandiosity among borderlines. You have grandiosity among psychopaths. You have grandiosity in the manic phase of bipolar disorder. There's also grandiosity there. You have grandiosity in paranoid personality disorder. You have grandiosity, etc., etc. Grandiosity is like temperature, like temperature in, in, in physical medicine. Yes. So narcissists have grandiosity as well. What is the narcissist's grandiosity? I am perfect. I am invulnerable. My actions have no adverse consequences. I will never pay the price for my actions. Which, which is where the narcissist begins to resemble very much a psychopath. This is the interface. Grandiosity is the interface between narcissism and psychopathy. That's why grandiosity is considered a form, to be a form of antagonism. It's a subsection of antagonism. So, I'm godlike. I'm godlike. I'm godlike in every sense. It's not that the narcissist says, wow, I have a high IQ, I'm a genius. Okay, it's arguable, <laughs> we can discuss this. The narcissist says, I am perfect in every sense. I am perfection reified. I am drop-dead gorgeous. I am a genius. I am unprecedented. I am super brilliant. I am emotional. I am more I'm moralistic. I am ethical, I'm etc. So it's very important to understand the concept of grandiosity. Grandiosity is not, not about being the best, being the biggest, being the richest. That's not grandiosity. That is Trumpism. Grandiosity is about being special, being unique. So, for example, a narcissist can be very proud that he is the biggest loser that his company had the biggest bankruptcy in the history of the world. He will be very proud of it because it makes him special. You could find narcissists who say, I, I fail so much, I don't know anyone else who is failing like me. That is grandiosity. Victimhood. You heard of victimhood? There are victimhood movements all over the world. Everyone and his dog and his mother-in-law are victims. There's so many victims in the world that it's difficult to find who is victimizing them? <laughs> There's problem finding abusers. So, victimhood is a form of grandiosity. Because in victimhood, what does the victim say? I am special. My history is unique. My personal story is unprecedented. 
And because I'm like that, I have special rights. And you have obligations towards me. Because I have these rights, you have duties to me. You have obligations to me. So it's a power play. Victimhood is narcissism, of course. And we are beginning to discover this. There are studies since 2020. There are studies in Israel, in British Columbia, in Taiwan, in China. Studies that discovered that in victimhood movements, you heard of Me Too, you heard of Black Lives Matter, you heard of all these victimhood movements, you, have, you heard of uh, far right, supremacists, white supremacists and so on. These are all victimhood movements. We made studies of these movements and we found out that the, the uh, prevalence and the incidence, I'm sorry, the incidence of narcissists and psychopaths in these groups is much higher than in the regular, in the normal population, in the general population. In other words, narcissists and, and psychopaths gravitate to these social movements. They infiltrate these social movements and they take over. They take over these social movements. Leaders with charisma, uh, gurus, and so on, they take over these victimhood movements and they use the victimhood movements for self-gratification, self-supply, narcissistic supply, and so on. So you see, grandiosity is not about being the best or the biggest, it's about being special. You could be special in a bad way. I'm the greatest serial killer in history. I'm the greatest failure in history. I'm the greatest, you know, loser in history. That's okay. That's a grandiose statement. Of course, if you are so special, if you are so special and unique, then you are entitled to special treatment. Some of you are doctors. You know the patients that come and they insist to meet the chief doctor and they insist on the best treatment and only they have this treatment and they should be first. They should not wait in line and so on. You know these kind of patients? Well, this is called the entitlement. Entitlement is the mirror image of grandiosity. If I'm special, if I'm godlike, if I'm unique, if I'm perfect, then I deserve to be treated in a way which is different to other people. All other people should wait in line. All other people can be treated by the nurse. All other people, you know, there are other people. They can have a bed not next to the window. There are other people. I deserve the best. I deserve the most. This is entitlement. This is known as entitlement. It goes hand in hand with grandiosity. And one of the major presenting signs of narcissists is this, that they are entitled. <laughs> they demand special treatment. Now, immediately, they have no possibility to delay gratification. They're highly impulsive and they become aggressive. Frustration in the case of narcissists is immediately converted to aggression. If you frustrate the narcissist, Narcissus becomes aggressive. This was discovered first time in 1939 by a guy called Dollard, the frustration, frustration aggression hypothesis. So, entitlement. Anankastia is a very fancy way of saying obsessive compulsive features. The narcissist, the narcissist, as I told you, is a bit paranoid. It's a bit paranoid. So the narcissist catastrophizes. The narcissist expects the worst. The, the worst case scenario is the most likely scenario. Because the narcissist expects the worst, he engages in rituals. He has rituals to prevent the bad outcomes, to prevent the worst from happening, which is a good definition of obsessive compulsive disorder or obsessive compulsive features. And this is known as an uncastia. Next is negative affectivity. Negative affectivity is simply the inability to experience positive emotions and the ability to experience only negative emotions. Narcissists and psychopaths experience anger, rage, envy. Envy is very big in narcissism. Narcissists envy. Narcissus envies everyone, all the time. Envy, hatred, 
Yeah, they're big on this. They are dysregulated when they experience these emotions. They lose control. They become very voluble and expressive and in your face and ostentatious and, and so on. But they are not able to experience any positive emotions. And this is known as negative affectivity. They cannot experience love. They cannot even experience joy and pleasure. They are unhedonic. They think they experience pleasure and joy, but it's not. It's not real pleasure, not real joy. It's possessing something or being noticed. It's gratification, actually. Gratification is not an emotion. Gratification is a reactive state of mind. They're unable to experience positive emotion. Think of a positive emotion and it is excluded from, uh, to the Nazis. He cannot access it. This is a very sad, sad state of affairs and we'll discuss why in the etiology. What happened to this kind of person that he is unable to access emotions and, and so on. But suffice it to say that narcissists have this negative affectivity. I mentioned this sociality, these antisocial behaviors. Some narcissists are a bit of a criminal. Some narcissists are hate people. Some narcissists are antagonistic and conflict, conflictual, and so on and so forth. And now, a few paragraphs about narcissists in therapy and narcissists in relationships, and then we move to the etiology. The etiology is a fascinating tour and I don't believe that many of you came across this very arcane and rare literature. Uh, doctors here accepted. So, um, therapy. When a narcissist attends therapy, a good diagnostician usually does not need psychological tests. The problem with psychological tests with narcissists and psychopaths is that they are a bit stupid. Because the psychological tests rely on honest self-reporting by the narcissist and psychopath. So what is the psychological test for narcissism? The NPI. And the psychological test for psychopathy? The PCLR. These are self-reporting tests. So the, the clinician is asking the psychopath, is it true that you tortured animals when you were young? And, and of course, the psychopath being very honest, that psychopaths are well known for honesty. Of course, the psychopath would say, yeah, I tortured them, I even killed them. And are you beating your wife on a regular basis? I'm kidding you not. These are some of the questions. Are you beating your wife on a regular basis or husband on a regular basis? And the expectation is that the narcissist or the psychopath would say, yeah, of course, would, would be honest, would be sincere. I find it funny. I find it funny that people, the people who develop these tests, who are leading experts on narcissism and psychopathy, fail to realize that you cannot expect honest answers from psychopaths and narcissists, and that self-reporting should be excluded from the diagnostic process, not become the main core of the diagnostic process. So a good diagnostician, actually, in my view, would, would not bother with the test. A good diagnostician would observe the narcissist and the psychopath can act. So they can act for one hour. They can act for one session. They can act for two sessions. They can act for three sessions. Sooner or later, the narcissist exits, uh, comes out. Sooner or later, the psychopath manifests. And a trained, experienced, qualified diagnostician will easily diagnose. At that point, it's important to understand that in the case of the psychopath, there is very, very little you can do as, as um, clinicians. I don't know how many of you are psychologists and so on, but even those who are not, it's important to understand that psychopathy is a lost case. Now, many things I say today, I am not allowed to say in a university. I'm not allowed. I'm not kidding. I'm not allowed. If I say these things, I mean, I, I'll be called uh, because... You are not supposed to say that it's hopeless, that something is hopeless. But we are we're in the family now. It's hopeless. Psychopathy is hopeless. Now, psychopathy is the extreme end of something known as antisocial personality disorder. And 
some forms of antisocial personality disorder are amenable to behavior modification. You see, if you provide these kind of people with some incentives, then they modify behaviors. They're very reactive in this sense. But not for long. I wouldn't waste resources on a psychopath. I wouldn't. End of story. Nothing. I mean, like nothing. <laughs> it's total waste of time. Narcissists, narcissists is, is a different story, a bit of a different story. It's important, I, I, as I will demonstrate to you a bit later in the etiology part, the mental age or the psychological age of a typical narcissist is around two to three years old. A typical narcissist is about two to three years old as far as mental and psychological age. And in more advanced cases, six to nine years old. You have some narcissists who are six to nine years old. That's, mu that's much more rare. You will understand why I'm saying this when we discuss the etiology. But they're babies, they're children, they're toddlers. One of the huge mistakes of modern psychiatry is that we attempt to treat narcissists as if they were adults. We bring the narcissist to our office, we make a therapeutic alliance with the narcissist, we make agreements and contracts, and all this time we are talking to someone who is two years old. It's unwise, and I'm being very careful with my words. It's unwise. Mm -hmm. To have any impact on the narcissist, in my view, and in the view of additional scholars who are now emerging, we think, as a, as a group, we think that we should use child psychology. We think child psychology would be much more e efficacious with narcissists than adult psychology. The second mistake is that narcissists are traumatized. We will discuss it in the etiology. Narcissism is a post-traumatic condition, simply post-traumatic condition. So we should use trauma therapies. We should use technique borrowed from trauma therapies. This is, what is a narcissist? It's a traumatized two-year-old. It's a two-year-old sitting in the corner, crying, terrified, doesn't know what to do, pretends that he's God. We'll discuss this in the etiology. And so when you come to a child who is two years old, is terrified, traumatized, has been abused, has been suffered, whatever, it doesn't make sense to treat this child as an adult and to ignore the trauma. To say this person is a horrible person, obnoxious, uh, you know, unpleasant and so on, and as if there was no trauma there. It's wrong, simply wrong. On human grounds, it's wrong. It's immoral even, I would say. And this is the state of current current treatments which tr attempt to deal with narcissism. It's a child, so you know how to deal with the child, at least those of you who are mothers. You know how to deal with the child. One of the things you can do with, with the narcissist, for example, is leverage the narcissist's grandiosity. If you want the narcissist to change, challenge his grandiosity. Tell him, let's see if you can change, or only you can change. Oh, I'm giving you a challenge. I don't believe that you can change. The narcissist will try to prove you wrong. Grandiosity is a major therapeutic tool. Major. And you have to play the game. You have to play the game. You have to enter the narcissist's world. And you have to agree with the narcissist, conform to the narcissist's view of himself. And then use the narcissist's perception of the world, the narcissist's view, point of view, the narcissist Weltanschauung, you have to use this against the narcissism, not against the narcissist, it's a child, but against the narcissism. Narcissism is a defense, it's a compensatory defense. Deep inside, the narcissist feels bad, feels frightened, feels unsafe, feels insecure, deep inside. Narcissism, pathological narcissism, is a compensation for this. Again, we'll discuss it in the etiology. You need to work with the compensation. If you fight the compensation, you will increase the trauma and you will trigger defenses, infantile defenses. For example, splitting. The narcissist will say, 
I'm all good, my therapist is all bad. He's stupid. He doesn't know what he's doing. Oh, she is my enemy. She's colluding with my wife against me. It will create paranoid ideation. Never confront the defenses. And that applies, that applies to relationships with narcissists. If you have a narcissistic husband, narcissist husband or a narcissist wife, or I know it's unheard of, a narcissist colleague or a narcissist patient, it's the same. Same principles apply. Don't go head in head, toe to toe. Don't confront. Don't conflict. Don't attack. Don't uh, provide advice. Don't offer help. Don't, don't put yourself in superior position. That will trigger the grandiosity immediately. But collaborate. It's a story. The narcissist, narcissism as a defense is a narrative. It's a movie. It's a story. Enter the story. Enter the story. And then from within the story, work with, the, with this child, work with this child to make the child feel safe, secure, so that the need for narcissism as a compensatory defense is reduced. And the child attempts, attempts slowly to reach out and maybe even to grow. But if you're confrontational as therapists, you're going to get nowhere. You're going to make the situation much worse. Grandiosity is your friend. The narcissist pathologies, the narcissistic pathologies are your friends as clinicians. They're your friends. So you can use all the features of narcissism against narcissism. I mentioned grandiosity. You know, let's see if you can do it. That's an example. So, this is my advice to you. Be more compassionate when you are looking at the narcissist. It's a, not a full-fledged human being, or at least not a full-fledged adult. It's a, it's a person in the making. It's a work in progress, which has been disrupted at some point. Disrupted. You know when you walk and see buildings which were not completed? You see buildings which the construction is not finished. That's a narcissist as you would not expect to have amenities and the best living conditions in, a, in such a building. You cannot expect to have a normal, a normal uh, intercourse or normal discourse with the narcissist and talk rationally and analyze and, and use techniques from adult therapy. I mean, it's, this is totally wrong approach, in my view, totally wrong approach. Let's talk, about, let's talk about what makes a narcissist. How does someone become a narcissist? As I mentioned, biologically, narcissists are born like all other people. They're newborns. They're babies. And then something happens. Whereas the vast majority of people, narcissism is over-diagnosed on YouTube. But in reality, there are very few narcissists. People with narcissistic personality disorder comprise 1% of the general population, and people with narcissistic style, another 6 to 7%. But the disorder is 1%. So something happens. First of all, it's reasonable to assume that there is a genetic, genetic predisposition to narcissism. Why? Because you take a family, and in the family there are five children. And these five children are close in age, like one year apart or something. Only one of them becomes a narcissist. The other five do not become narcissists. And they're all exposed to the same mother, same father, same environment, same dysfunction, same circumstances, everything identical or similar. And yet only one becomes narcissist. So it's very logical to assume that there is some genetic, some hereditary component. We haven't found it yet. While we did find gen genetic components in psychopathy, psychopathy, we did isolate and identify genes that affect or create the condition of psychopathy. We also, in numerous studies, we have demonstrated brain abnormalities in psychopathy. 
the psychopath's brain is very different to, he to a healthy brain. But I mean very, on multiple levels. The white matter, amygdala, I mean, everything is disrupted severely. Um, we didn't find this in narcissism. When we studied narcissists, we at this stage don't have such, don't have any proof that it's a brain abnormality or that's uh, any hereditary component at this stage. So, because of that, we are forced to focus on the environment, not nature, but nurture. We focus on the environment, we ask ourselves, what on earth has gone so wrong in these families that produced such a human being, or a non-human being, as you wish, that produced such a constellation, such a person? What has gone so wrong? And now the second part of the lecture is about what has gone wrong. In the background of narcissists, the narcissists we have studied, in the background we find what we call adverse childhood experiences, ACEs. We find abuse, we find trauma, we find suffering, we find pain, we find terror, we find events which are terrifying to a child. Uh, we find family dynamics which are conducive to anxiety and insecurity, for example, divorce, or, or fighting between the parents that devolves into physical violence, domestic abuse, domestic violence, and so on. There is no exception. In all narcissists that we have studied, there is a background of familial dysfunction. However, it's very important to define the word abuse. Because if you go to people and say, all narcissists have been abused as children, they say, it's not true. My narcissist mother is the best mother. She loves him. She adores him. It's not true. He didn't suffer anything. There was no abuse, no trauma. This is bullshit. Many, many people say this. That's because they misunderstand the concept of abuse. There is classical abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, incest, um, psychological abuse, verbal abuse. These are classical forms, easy to identify. But that's not the majority of abuse. The majority of abuse is hidden and not easy to identify. Let me give you a few examples. If, if I have a child and I'm forcing the child to realize my unfulfilled dreams and fantasies. I had a dream to be a pianist, and I never became a pianist, but I'm forcing my child to become a pianist. Or I had a dream, or I'm a doctor, and I'm forcing my child to be a doctor, which is a bit more common. Well, that's abuse. If I'm in a bad relationship with my husband, and I'm using my son as a substitute spouse, my son becomes my confidant, my good friend, I'm, I'm, I'm consulting my son, I'm uh, confiding in my son, I share everything with my son, I gossip about his father with my son. That's abuse. It, this is known as parentifying. Instrumentalizing. If I am spoiling my child, I'm pampering my child. I'm super protective of my child. I don't let my child play in the dirt. I don't let my child socialize with peers. I don't let my child go out to the street because there are dangerous cars in the streets and so on. And so I'm protecting my child. I'm a good mother, no? Or a good father. I'm a good parent. Of course not. That's abuse. It's abuse because growth, personal growth, is driven by exposure to reality and to peers. You need to, to be in touch with reality. You need to suffer. You need to experience loss. You need to be wounded. You need to be sick in order to grow. There's no other way to grow. And if your parents isolate you, cosset you, prevent you from this, don't allow you to play with your peers or go out to the street, they're abusive. This is abuse. However, we don't consider it to be abusive. 
that's the, <laughs> that's the enigma here. We don't consider such behaviors to be abusive. Let me mention one more example. A mother who does not let her child separate from her. She doesn't let the child separate. If the child tries to separate, she blackmails the child. She says, I cannot cope without you. I'm not going to live without you. You know, you need to stay and help me. I'm invalid. I cannot move. I need your help. This, that. That's an example of abuse. So there are numerous forms of abuse. And when I say that in the background of all narcissists there is abuse, I am not talking about broken bones or uh, sexual penetration. There are many other options to abuse a child. Abuse is any situation where the child is not allowed to become an individual, where the boundaries of the child are not respected or not allowed to emerge, and where when the parent objectifies the child, treats the child as some kind of object. This is the definition of abuse, and it includes many, many behaviors which are considered to be very good parental behaviors, but of course are very bad. So, what happens to a child who is exposed to abuse? There is a concept in uh, psychoanalysis, it's known as the dead mother. Now, you notice, by the way, that I keep saying mother much more than father, right? I, I'm using mother nine times, I'm using father once. That's because I'm a man, and I'm chauvinistic and sexist. No, that's not the explanation in this particular case. That's because the mother has a critical role until age 36 months. And the father's role in this, initial, in this initial period is much more limited. Much more limited. The father becomes more important than the mother after age three years, when the father is actually a socialization agent. agent. The father introduces society to the child, teaches the child skills, and so on. But this is much later. In the formative years, which are between 0 and 36 months, and then there's another period, but the initial formative years, the mother is critical. I would even go as far as saying that the mother is the only one, the only one with psychodynamic and psychological influence on the formation of the child. I'm not alone in this, of course. Bowlby, Bowlby who came up with attachment theory, had the same ideas, <laughs> agrees with, with me, or I agree with him and so on. It is, of course, politically incorrect to say this. If you dare to say this, you will be fired and, uh, and probably driven over by <laughs> someone in the academy, but it happens to be the truth. We, we call these years formative years for a very good scientific reason. 80% of the structure of the brain is ready by age 3 and 90% of the structure of the brain is ready by age five. That's why we call this period the formative years. So the mother is critical here, and there is a concept in psychoanalysis known as the dead mother. Dead mother metaphorically. The concept was invented by André Green, who is a French psychoanalyst, of all things. Dead in the sense that it is an absent mother, emotionally absent. She's absent because she's depressive, or she's absent because she's selfish, or she's absent because she's entitled and grandiose, or she's absent and the child is not good enough for her, or she's absent because of her relationship with her spouse or her boyfriend or whatever. Be that as it may, this is a kind of mother who does not function. It does not exist in the life of the child. And in the vast majority of the, of the anamnesis and etiology of narcissists, we find a dead mother. A dead mother is also a mother who takes over the child, a, a mother who is overprotective of the child, a mother who is refusing the child, refusing to let the child go away, separate, individuate. There's one test for a good mother, Winnicott, Winnicott who was a pediatrician before he became a psychologist. Winnicott suggested the, coined the phrase good enough mother. But actually, a good enough mother, there's one test 
If you want to ask yourself, have I been a good mother? There's one test. You push the child away. That's a good mother. I know it's counterintuitive. It's against intuition. But that's a test of a good mother. Did you push your child away? Not in a bad way. Not abusively. Not, but did you give the child the freedom to separate from you with a full sense of security? This is known as a secure base. Were you a secure base? Did you allow the child to walk away and to become a person, to acquire personhood? And this process is known as separation individuation. Narcissists have not been allowed by their mothers to separate individuate. This is a key insight in narcissism. Narcissists are people who as children were not allowed to walk away, were not allowed to develop boundaries, were not allowed to become individuals, were not allowed to separate from mother. This is the key. If you want to understand narcissism with a single sentence, that's the key. Yes, yes. The myth, the myth that female narcissists are different to male narcissists is just that. Yes, it's a myth. The, the etiology is the same. It makes a difference. That's not how we think today. After, I mean, Lowen, for example, in his, uh, in his famous book about narcissism, uh, did not take into account attachment theory. He did not take into account social learning theory and so on. So we've... Although his book was 1979, I think, uh, and attachment theory was in the 60s, he didn't take it into account. Um, so we, here we have a child with a mother who is in some way dysfunctional. A mother who does not provide good enough motherhood. She's not a good enough mother. And consequently, the child cannot separate from this kind of mother and become an individual. He doesn't undergo the process known as separation individuation. Those of you who want to read or learn more about this process, you should read works by Margaret Mahler and Melanie Klein, if, you, if you're so inclined. The child at this point reacts emotionally. The reflex, if you wish, the instinct, the drive, if you are Freudian, you're inclined to Freud, but whatever name you call it, the drive, the inner drive, is to say goodbye to mother. Have a look, observe. Observe toddlers who are two years old. They hug, they hug mommy, they hug the leg, I mean, they can't reach higher. They hug mommy, then they let go of mommy, they walk a few steps, they walk a few steps, they look back, they look back, and they run back to mommy. This is separation individuation in action. The baby, the baby takes on the world. Can you imagine? You're two years old. All you know is mother. That's your world. And suddenly you have the urge and the drive and the confidence and the bravery, the courage to leave this island of stability, to leave this secure base and explore the world. The unknown It's the greatest adventure and the most extreme display of courage any of you will ever make. Never mind what you did later in life. There's nothing more courageous than this. And also nothing more frightening than this. It's terrifying. So the baby needs to know that mother is there. Mother has his back. And this is known as secure base. That's why babies run back to mommy. After they explore a little, they run back and back and back. And, the, and gradually, they run a bit further, and a bit further, and a bit further, until they end up in university. So, this is a process of separation, individuation. And this is the failure in narcissism. But this creates in the child emotional reactions. Obviously, if you have a drive, and you're unable to fulfill it, and at the same time, you're attached to a mother who is non-responsive, who is absent. So not only she doesn't allow you to become yourself, when you make this sacrifice of not becoming yourself, she is not there. 
Who are you making this sacrifice for? There's not, nobody there. The mother is not there. So this kind of child experiences three effects, three emotions. Number one, shame, enormous shame. The child obviously feels inadequate, feels that something bad is happening, out of control. There's a sense of being objectified, being, and it's a huge shame. If I treat you as an object, your first reaction would actually be not anger, but shame. Second would be anger. And very often the anger is triggered by the fact that I made you feel sh ashamed. So, shame. And then there is grief. The child grieves what it could have become and never did become. So we have shame and we have grief. And then we have what? Emptiness. We have emptiness. This is known as the empty schizoid core. This is work by Otto Kernberg, by um, Seinfeld, not that Seinfeld, Jeffrey Seinfeld. There, there's quite a lot of work on this, um, on the empty schizoid core. The child disappears, vanishes. Why? In the process of growing up, in the process of becoming, we internalize, we introject, we internalize role models. We internalize people in our lives that we imitate and so on. So, we first, first person we internalize is mother. So, we internalize mother. If mother is an absence, if mother is empty, we would internalize emptiness. And if we are not allowed to become an individual, we would remain in emptiness. And this is the empty schizoid core. The narcissist is an absence pretending to be a presence. At that point, at that point, there is a huge sense of terror, absolute terror. It's a two-year-old in the best case. This process starts at six months, up to 36 months. It's a two-year-old, it's a one-year-old. And this tiny being has no one to rely on. There's nobody there. It's enormous fear, enormous terror. And when the mother does interact with the child, her interactions are traumatizing and abusive. So the terror multiplies, is even bigger. And at that point, the child cannot, be, cannot feel safe with, with mother. There's no secure base. And the child fails to develop something called object constancy. Object constancy or object permanence is the belief that mother will, will always be there even if she's physically not present. It's part of the internalization process. The child internalizes mother, so the child has an internal mother. So even when mother is not in the room, the child has a mother, mother introjection. It's a mother internal object that the child interacts with. But if the mother is dysfunctional, if the mother is absent, if the mother is non-responsive, the child cannot internalize. So there's no external mother and there's no internal mother. And this is known as object inconstancy. So the child is terrified. He doesn't know what to do, where to go. And in some cases, luckily in very few cases, in some cases, a narcissist is born. And I will explain now how narcissism compensates for this situation. You remember, this is a lonely child. It's a terrified child. A child that has no one to rely on, no one to interact with, no one to talk to. A child that is not seen by the mother. The mother's gaze defines the child. So this child has no core identity. He's empty inside. He's empty outside. It's terrifying. It's like being caught in a swirling black hole. And then the child 
finds a solution. And that solution is pathological narcissism. What is the solution? The child invents an imaginary friend. The imaginary friend is everything the child is not. The child is small. The friend is big. The child is helpless. The friend is omnipotent, all-powerful. The child cannot predict the behavior of adults around. The imaginary friend is all-knowing, is omniscient. The child is, is being told or experiences itself as a failure. He is ashamed. He is grieving over the unrealized, unactualized potentials. The imaginary friend is perfect, brilliant, godlike. This imaginary friend is known in clinical literature as the false self. But here is something very interesting. The false self is godlike. So it's a primitive religion. This is a religion invented by a two-year-old, right? It's a two-year-old, and he invents this religion. And there is a deity, there's a divinity here. What do we know about primitive religions? What's the first thing we do in a primitive religion? Human sacrifice. Human sacrifice. The development of the primitive religion of the narcissist, the narcissistic, the, the child about to become a narcissist, is similar. There's a bit of a human sacrifice. The child sacrifices himself to this divinity, to this deity. This sacrifice actually eliminates the child, deletes the child, and the child merges with the false self, becomes one with the false self. From that moment, there's a narcissist. It cannot be diagnosed. We cannot diagnose narcissistic personality disorder that early, but there's a narcissist, psychologically speaking. So the solution is this imaginary friend who is going to protect the child and restore safety and stability and so on and so forth. At that point, the child creates an imaginary world. This imaginary world is called paracosm. It's a fantasy defense. It's a kind of fantasy defense. And the child inhabits this fantasy. The child gives up on reality, gives up on reality completely. And, and emerges within the fantasy now as a god. Because remember, he merged with the false self. So now he's a god within the fantasy. And it is within this fantasy that narcissism thrives and flourishes. When we give up on reality, it has a name. This is called dissociation. The child dissociates. He deletes. He erases from memory large parts of his life that are intolerable, unbearable, painful. He doesn't want to remember these things. So there's a lot of dissociation in early narcissism and in borderline, of course. There's a lot of dissociation. And to compensate for these memory gaps, there is fantasy. So when you talk to a narcissist, a narcissist would tell you something. And he would say, but that's not true. I have evidence that it's not true. And the narcissist would say, well, of course it's true. And he would argue with you. Because the confabulations, these stories, these pieces of fiction that are intended to compensate for the memory gaps, they are perceived by the child as real. The child, the fantasy of the child is the child's reality. And that remains for life. That everything that's happening until age three remains with the narcissist for life because the narcissist gets stuck at this point, never, never evolves, never grows up. There is no progress, evolution, or growth, or development after age three or two in narcissism. I mean, the narcissist can acquire skills. He can learn many languages. He can have very good episodic memory and so on, memory of professional memory, but emotionally and psychologically, that's, that's a two, three-year-old, that's where he's stuck, and he never, never, ever moves forward. He never becomes an adult, ever. He is trapped in a world of fantasy, and when he comes across you, 
when he says, oh, I want, I want this person as my intimate partner, or I want this person as my best friend, or I want this person as my colleague, or whatever, the narcissist forces you into his fantasy. If you want to be with the narcissist, you must enter the fantasy. And that's why it's known as a shared fantasy. If you refuse to enter the narcissist's fantasy, the narcissist will have nothing to do with you. And if you do it aggressively, if you reject the narcissist aggressively, you become an enemy. The narcissist is protective of his fantasy, of his grandiosity, and becomes very aggressive when you challenge the grandiosity or when you challenge the fantasy. And the fantasy is a story, a movie, a theater production, a play. It's a story about how the narcissist is wonderful and great and accomplished and amazing and, and handsome and, I don't know, brilliant and genius. That's a story. That's a fantasy. And because this is the narcissist's home, this fantasy, and because it's built on grandiosity, you cannot touch it. You're not allowed to touch it. You're invited as a guest. You can share with the, with the narcissist the fantasy for many decades, but you're always a guest. You, you need to understand this. If you're married to a narcissist for 25 years, you're his guest in his fantasy. You're never the owner of the fantasy. You are never at liberty to change the fantasy, to negotiate the fantasy, to redefine the fantasy, or even to get fully acquainted with the fantasy. You're just a guest. And as a guest, there are rules. You cannot attack the fantasy. You cannot challenge it. You cannot undermine it. And one element of the fantasy is the narcissist's specialness, grandiosity, divine nature. It's a major element of the fantasy. And this is the fantasy defense that emerges in, in childhood. I have some good news. Uh, we are coming more or less to the end. So, I will talk to you right now, we'll discuss right now the process of relationships. How the narcissist forms a relationship. Remember the narcissist is a child. Remember the narcissist is a child. Remember the narcissist is a child. If you remember anything from this lecture, remember the narcissist is a child. End of story. When the narcissist, mm -hmm. as an adult, he's never an adult, he's an adult chronologically, he's adult biologically, but he's never an adult psychologically. When the narcissist as a chronological biological adult is trying to have a relationship with you, is trying to have a relationship with you as a child. As a child. So let's take an example, an intimate relationship, a romantic relationship, a marriage, a girlfriend, boyfriend, this kind of relationship. The narcissist approaches this kind of relationship as a child. So who are you if he is a child? Who are you in the relationship if he is a child? Yes, you're the mother. You're the mother. You're the maternal figure. When the narcissist enters a relationship with you, which is romantic or intimate, this is one example, yes? You're the mother. And now, what can you say about mother when you're a child, when you're two years old, when you're three years old? How do you see mother? You see her as perfect. She's perfect. The narcissist idealizes the maternal figure. You can do no wrong. You're amazingly intelligent. You're super gorgeous. He has never felt this way, <laughs> the way he feels now, etc., etc. You're unprecedented. You're your mother. You're an ideal mother. You're not even a mother uh, in adolescence. In adolescence, adolescents begin to see the nuances. Mother can be good, mother can be bad. They're beginning to create composites. They have nuances, gray areas. The child sees everything in terms all good, all bad, all black, all white. This is known as dichotomous thinking. So when the child approaches you, you're all good by definition, because you have to be the mother. You have to assume the maternal role. Now, 
How do, we, how do you know when you're two years old? How do you know if your mother is a good mother? You test her. <coughs> you, have, you have to test her, of course. Because your original mother, the biological mother, sucked. was very bad. <laughs> it was not a good example. So this time, you're not going to make this mistake again. You're going to test the mother. How do you test the mother? You abuse her. You abuse her. If you abuse the mother and she sticks around, she stays, she doesn't abandon you, she doesn't leave you, then she's a good mother. It means she loves you unconditionally. Never mind what you do to her. Without any conditions and prejudices, she will love you. But you need to make sure of that, yeah? So you need to abuse her really badly, verbally, cheat on her, do horrible things to her. This is known as narcissistic abuse. I was the first to describe it in literature. And this is narcissistic abuse. It's a test. It has other functions. But initially, it's a test. If you pass the test and you stick around, you're a masochist or <laughs> codependent or something. You stick around, then you must be a good mother. You must be a good mother because you passed the test. So at this point, you're a mother and he's a child. But at the same time, he becomes your parent. He becomes your mother or your father, usually your mother. He becomes your mother. So you experience the same. He regresses you. He infantilizes you. He pushes you back to the womb. You become his mother. He becomes your mother. And this is my principle of dual mothership. There's a dual mothership here. And so sometimes you feel as if you are the child and he is the, the father or the mother and sometimes you feel as if he is the child and you are the mother. And both feelings are correct. Both functions exist in the relationship. This is the dual mothership principle. And so at this point, there is a big happy family. There's a narcissist, you are his mother. What next? What happened with the original mother? The narcissist failed to separate from her, failed to individuate, yes? The mother did not let him, did not let the narcissist as a child to become a person, to become an individual. The narcissist this time needs to separate and individuate from you. This is known in psychology as repetition compulsion. The narcissist repeats early childhood dynamics and early conflicts with the mother in his intimate relationships. So now you're the mother, and he's the child, and he's growing up. He's growing up in the relationship. And you're a good mother. You're a secure base. He can trust you because he abused you no end, and you stayed. So you can be trusted. So now he trusts you, and now it's safe for him to go out into the world. He is recreating age two, simply recreating it. He lets go of you, and he leaves you. He goes out into the world. But how to do that? Remember that at the beginning of the relationship, he idealized you. He made you perfect. How to give up on a perfect entity? How to give up on an idealized version of a mother? The perfect mother, the amazing. How to do that? You devalue her. You say she is actually not a good mother. She is actually she deceived me, or she is changed. She has changed. She is not what she used to be, etc. And this process is known as devaluation. So we have idealization, devaluation. And following devaluation, there is discard, the getting rid of the mother figure. And this is the this is the universal pattern of relationships with narcissists. Idealization, devaluation, discard. After that, there are additional stages. Replacement, hoovering. We're not going to it right now. But you understand now the dynamic. It is a reenactment of age two. Reenactment. And he needs to separate from you. And to separate from you, he needs to make you an enemy. He needs to make you a bad object. He needs to make you devalued, not worthy of him. And that way he gets rid of you. He separates from you. And he has a chance to become an individual now. Because this time, with this mother, he got it right. He separated. 
But of course, it never works. It never works, and it needs to go through the same cycle again and again and again. Why are you staying in such a relationship? Why? Why most, most intimate partners of narcissists stay with them, actually? Don't leave them. Minority leave them, but majority stay with them, or stay with them and then leave them. Like, why do you stay at all? You've been abused. Why don't you walk away? Because it's addictive. What's addictive about it? What is so addictive? The narcissist idealizes you, and he gives you access to your idealized image through his gaze. You see yourself through the narcissist's gaze as an ideal object. Suddenly, you're amazing, you're perfect, you are the recipient of laser-focused attention. You're the only person in the world. You're godlike, you're, you're a goddess. You're... This is an intoxicating feeling. You are given the opportunity to love yourselves the way a mother should have loved you. A mother should have loved you as an idealized object. When a baby is born, I mean, babies suck. Baby, babies are really bad things. I mean, they, they cry, they do other things which I will not go into because I'm on camera. I mean, it's a tough job to raise a baby. And it's not pleasant. I raised four of them, so I should know. It's not pleasant. It's not a pleasant thing. And I'm being very gentle right now. It's horrible, actually. The sleeplessness and the dirt and the... So the mother needs to idealize the baby. There's no other way. The mother could not cope with all these challenges if she did not idealize the baby. She says, this is the most beautiful baby in the world. It's the most clever baby in the world. It's amazing. So, so for what if he misses a, a leg? <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful baby. So, sorry? Did any baby speak here? <laughs> There's a baby here. <laughs> so the mother idealizes the baby. A mother's love, a functional, healthy mother's love, let it be clear, initially involves idealization. Later on, I mean, but initially involves idea. So when you're idealized by the narcissist in the dual mothership, remember, he's your mother. When you're idealized by the narcissist, you feel like a baby again. You feel like you are being loved by a mother figure the way you should have been loved. Unconditionally. Idealized. Perfect. Amazing entity. Fascinating. And so this is intoxicating. This is addictive. Because you are given the chance, given the chance, to love yourself finally like a mother. You are given the chance to mother yourself, to parent yourself. It's a reparenting opportunity or self-parenting opportunity through the narcissist's gaze. So you depend on the narcissist. You can't do this alone. You have to look into the narcissist's eyes when he's idealizing you. Then you see your reflection, sometimes physical reflection, in the eyes. And it's, that's it. You forget everything else. You can withstand any abuse and anything. Because this experience of self-infatuation, self-limerence, is super powerful. And this is the secret of the narcissist, how he holds you so strongly and why it's so difficult to break the bond. The trauma that the narcissist inflicts on you is coupled with unconditional, extreme, unmitigated love. You learn to associate, within the relationship, you learn to associate trauma with love. And so you bond. This is known as trauma bonding. The whole process is in, in clinical literature is called intermittent reinforcement. There's intermittent reinforcement. The narcissist loves you, hates you, attacks you, hugs you, criticizes you, praises you. You never know what to expect. Negative, positive, black, white, hot, cold. This is intermittent reinforcement. But at the foundation of inter inter intermittent reinforcement, there is a message. There's a message. I love you unconditionally because you are perfect. 
That's why you deserve unconditional love. And now I give you permission to love yourself exactly the same way. And you can do that through me. If you have any doubts whether you deserve unconditional love, if you doubt, if you suspect that you may not be perfect, that maybe you're not ideal, all you have to do is look into my eyes. And you will see that you are. And that's the end of the story. This is a form of extreme trauma bonding because it involves conflicting signals, mixed signals. And so there's a double bind here. There's a situation where the signals don't match. And you become dependent on the source of the signal to obtain the positive signal. Because this person is capable of giving you negative signal, you become dependent on him for the positive signal. And this is how intermittent reinforcement works. So, one last thing, I promise. But I've been promising it a long time, so I don't know why you trust me. It's because I'm idealizing you. I know you're perfect. Yeah. One last thing is a distinction between covert and overt narcissism. This distinction, by the way, you need to know, is um, being seriously doubted and questioned nowadays. Seriously doubted and questioned nowadays. Um, until a few years ago, we made a distinction between overt, grandiose narcissists, and not to go now into half an hour of explanation what is an overt, grandiose narcissist, is Donald Trump. All right? Imagine Donald Trump, that's an overt, grandiose narcissist. And covert narcissist. Covert narcissist is a shy, vulnerable, fragile narcissist who fails to obtain attention. Someone who fails to obtain attention. So we call it collapse narcissist. It's, a, it's someone who wants to be a narcissist but doesn't know how. <laughs> to cut a long story short. So that's a covert narcissist and overt. But today we are beginning to change our minds a bit in the profession. I contributed a little to this. We are beginning to think that overt grandiose narcissists are actually a type, a variant of psychopathy, of psychopath. Whereas the covert narcissist is the only real type of narcissist. So we are beginning to focus on the covert narcissist. Now the emphasis in academe, academe is on the covert narcissist because we are beginning more and more to believe that this is the real narcissist. Why? Because he compensates. The covert narcissist compensates. It's a compensatory structure. Whereas in overt grandiose narcissism, we find narcissists who, are, who actually fully believe their delusions, their grandiosity, their fantasies, and we fail to find what they're compensating for. So we're beginning to think that these are psychopaths. Anyhow, this distinction is still valid, covert versus overt. We still find it in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, although they do not use these words. They don't use covert and overt, but they describe the two types. And what I want to focus on is what is known as primitive defense mechanism. And this will be the end of the lecture, and you can all go home unless you have questions. You have been held hostage if you didn't notice. So, I want to discuss primitive infantile defenses. Again, remember the main lesson of this lecture? A narcissist is a child. As a child, the narcissist has what is known as primitive or infantile defenses, defense mechanisms. These are defense mechanisms that develop in early childhood. Now, what is a defense mechanism? Initially, uh, another Jew, Sigmund Freud, came up with the definition of, of defense mechanism, which was that defense mechanism is an attempt to redirect or reframe or suppress, repress, I'm sorry, or uh, alter or change a drive or an urge that is not acceptable. So we have some urge, some drive, sexual, for example, is not acceptable, I have no idea why, <laughs> is not acceptable, and then uh, we transform it somehow. So there are many ways to transform this urge or this drive so that it's not recognizable. 
it's transformed in a way that consciousness doesn't recognize it. Because if it does recognize it, it creates dissonance. It creates conflict, internal conflict. We cannot admit that we are animals who want to have sex. Well, most of us cannot. So, in this case, the sexuality or the sex drive will be converted in a way that we will not recognize that it's sex. Example is sublimation. Sublimation is a defense mechanism where the sexuality is converted into socially acceptable activities and energy. So if I write many, many books, it's because I'm not getting enough sex, etc. So this is sublimation. But there are many other, there are many other types of, of defense mechanisms. Okay, so this was the initial definition. Today we have a different approach, different approach to defense mechanisms. Actually, in between, there was another definition, another school. It was known as the object relations school. Melanie Klein and so on and so forth. I will not go into it. Today, we have another approach to defense mechanisms. We think the main role of defense mechanisms today is to make reality acceptable to us. Not to make internal reality acceptable to us, but to make external reality acceptable to us. So, uh, and I think we should combine. So I think what happens is internal reality determines external reality. I have a drive, then I act. I do something. Then I don't feel good about what I did, so I use defenses. Or I don't feel good about how I felt. I don't feel good about my motivation, so I use defenses. I think it's all mixed. Clearly, it's about falsifying reality. <laughs> Simply put. Falsifying internal reality, falsifying external reality. Falsify reality, that's defenses. The child falsifies reality from, from, literally from age four or five weeks. Why? Think about it. You are five or six month, uh, weeks old, if you can think about it. And you want, you want access to mommy's breast. You're not the only one who wants access to mommy's breast, but other people want access to mommy, mommy's breast for different reasons. You want access to mommy's breast in, in, to eat. You need to eat. Sometimes mommy, exactly like in relationship with father, sometimes mommy's breast is available, sometimes mommy's breast is not available. So, sometimes the baby is gratified and happy, sometimes the baby is frustrated and angry. Right? By definition. Sometimes mommy is in the room, sometimes she leaves the room. So, immediately the world splits, the world breaks. There's a world that is all happiness and all joy and all pleasure and all gratification. And there's a world that is all frustration and all anger. And all, so the world breaks. This break, this chasm, this breaking of the world, this schism is known as splitting. This is the splitting defense mechanism. The baby says, uh, there is a mummy that won't let me eat. That's a bad mummy. And there's a mummy that lets me eat. There's a good mummy. So there's good and bad. The concepts of good and bad emerge. Later on, the baby internalizes. It's the baby says, mummy is all good, I'm all bad. We're not going to eat right now. But this is splitting. Narcissists are stuck, not at age four, five, six weeks, but they're stuck at age two. Splitting is active at age two, very. So they split. That's why in a relationship with you, Initially, you're all good, and at the end, you're all bad. That's why they, they, have, they say, either you're with me or you're against me. Black and white, evil versus good. It's always divided into two mutually exclusive groups. Nothing in between, no gray zones, no nuances, nothing. And this is known as splitting. It's very common in narcissism. It's very common in borderline personality disorder. The next defense is projection. Projection is when you have something inside that you cannot accept. For example, deep inside, you know that you're weak. Or even worse, deep inside, you know that you're stupid. And you cannot accept it. So what you do, you take these parts in you that are not acceptable to you, that are egodystonic, that are not acceptable to you, that you don't feel comfortable with, that you reject. 
that you hate, the parts of you, and you throw them on someone else. You just throw them. This is why it's called projection. You project them. So you, if you're weak, you would say, you're weak. I'm strong, you're weak. I'm generous, you're stingy. So you project these parts. This is known as projection. By the way, there's a very interesting defense mechanism not connected, not connected to this. There's a very interesting defense mechanism known as reaction formation. Reaction formation is when there is something I hate about myself and then I behave in a way that proves that I don't have it. Let's take an example. Imagine that I'm a latent homosexual. I'm gay, but I hate it. I don't want to be gay. I don't want to be homosexual. I find it unacceptable for cultural reasons, social reasons, religious reasons. I don't know. I hate the fact that actually I'm gay. So what do I do? I prosecute gays. I become homophobic. I begin to attack gays, physically maybe. I, 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 you know, I make propaganda against gays. That way I prove to the world, and especially to myself, that I'm not gay. So this is reaction formation. It's a way to project the part and then behave in a, in a certain way. Anyhow, projective identification is even more interesting. Projective identification is there's something in me that I hate. Okay, imagine, for example, I'm stingy. For example, so I hate it. I don't want to be stingy. I want to be generous, but I cannot. I cannot be generous. I'm stingy. So what I do is I attribute this to, for example, my wife. So my wife is stingy. I'm not stingy. I'm generous, but it's because of my wife that I have to be stingy. So this is projection. And then there is projective identification. My wife loves me, so she behaves as a stingy person, just to make me happy. She knows that I am saying about her that she's stingy. She loves me. She wants me to be pleased and gratified and satisfied. So she adopts the projected part. She begins to behave like a stingy person. And this is projective identification. We find it a lot with domestic abuse, domestic violence. Studies have shown that women who grew up in a household with domestic violence seek partners who would be violent with them, partners who would abuse them. They seek them out. They filter them. They, I mean, nice guys are not interesting. They look for abusers. They look for people who would beat them up. Why? That's projective identification. The, these women who have been exposed to domestic violence, they seek a man who would fulfill the role of abuser. So they project the part on him and he accepts it. And he begins to abuse. And this is, we'll come to it. This is a projective identification. And, uh, bear in mind your question, don't forget it. Last one is rationalization. For example, you're sitting here and you're saying, why on earth did I come here? It was such a mistake. This is horrible. And then you say, but well, I'm learning something. It's, uh, you know, this is rationalization. Rationalization is when you uh, invent some story or some narrative where your actions, your emotions, your cognitions makes sense not only to you, but would make sense to other people. Rationalization, of course, is very self-serving and very self-deceiving, very often. We rationalize the most horrible behaviors. I had no choice, or I'm doing this because I love you. I'm abusing you because I love you. You know, this is rationalization. All these mechanisms are infantile. They're mechanisms of, of, of kids, not adults. Children have these mechanisms. So the narcissist is a child, and he has all these behaviors within any type of interpersonal relationships, with intimate partners, with, the, with his own children, with colleagues. He would have all this. I've described to you someone who is a very difficult person. In medicine, we have the concept of difficult patient. Many difficult patients are actually narcissists. Uh, we have difficult colleagues. We have difficult spouses. We have difficult children. We have difficult, you know. So difficult people. Many, many 
of these difficult people are actually narcissists. Psychopaths are goal-oriented. The psychopath wants something. He wants sex. He wants money. He wants access. He wants power. And he will stop at nothing. He has no inhibitions. And he will stop at nothing. And he will accomplish what he set out to do. Narcissists want attention. They're children. They just want attention. And they just want a mother. And when the narcissist tests you for his mother, he focuses on four things. And I call them the four S's. Sex, supply, attention, uh, services, and safety. You give him two of these four S's, he's yours, as any child would be. Psychopath is not, not built this way. A psychopath is a machine. It's a, it's a optimizes the direction to obtaining something, regardless of the cost to you, or sometimes to himself. Psychopaths, in this sense, are both much simpler than narcissists. It's a much, much simpler construct than narcissists. Much simpler personality. That's why many, many criminals are actually psychopaths. Because they're simple people. These are simple people. On the one hand. And on the other hand, Psychopaths, in my view, psychopathy, antisocial personality disorder, should not be a mental illness, in my view. It's not a clinical entity. A psychopath is someone who refuses to play by the rules. <laughs> Simple. He doesn't play by the rules. He doesn't accept the law. He doesn't accept norms. He's not normative. He, he doesn't accept no as an answer. He must have yes. He is goal-oriented. A psychopath is you, exaggerated. You all want sex, he wants more. You all love money, we are in Sistina, he wants more. We all want access and power, he wants more. It's more, it's a caricature, an exaggeration of a human being. The narcissist is not an exaggeration of a human being. It's debatable, as I said at the very beginning, if it is a human being. It's the narcissist is a disruption in the formation of the self to the point that there's no self. And so, whereas the psychopath is immediately recognizable, and we can disagree with the psychopath. We can say, wow, that's horrible what he's doing. Uh, you know, he's this, he's that. But it's recognizable to us. We resonate with the psychopath. We understand. We're all psychopaths sometimes, you know. There are situations where we're all a bit psychopathic, all a bit criminalized, all a bit antisocial. It's normal. But if you're a healthy person, there are no situations where you are, where you are um, for example, grandiose, or where you are totally in fantasy, totally unaware of reality, or renounce reality. <coughs> these, are, these are not um, exaggerations of a human type. That's another human type. Narcissism is another human type. That's why I focused in today's lecture on narcissism, not on psychopathy. I personally find psychopathy boring. I find it boring because it's such a simple construct with such simple psychodynamics. It's perfectly understandable. It's even serial killers essentially are perfectly understandable. I just collaborated with the with the FBI profiler on, on serial killing uh, case. And there's an interview on my YouTube channel if you want to see. But I found, I found it non-challenging, in effect. Non-challenging. It's about power. It's about sex. It's about, yeah, but I understand a serial killer. So can you. If you're honest with yourselves, you can understand a serial killer. You, cannot, you will never do it. You will never engage in this kind of behavior. But have you never engaged in a power play? In a mind game? Have you never wished someone dead? It's, these are human impulses. The narcissist is divorced, chose to be divorced as a child from humanity and from reality, developed his own fantasy world and emigrated there, moved, <laughs> moved to live there. And if you don't have access to this paracosm, this fantasy specifically, you cannot understand the narcissist by extrapolating who you are. 
You cannot understand the Narcissist by saying, okay, let me look inside myself and see if I resonate. You cannot resonate. There's no resonance with the Narcissist. While with the psychopath, there is. Of course there is. Okay, you have suffered long enough. You're all traumatized and abused beyond the point of endurance. You have become narcissistic, I'm sure, many of you by now. Uh, There is something called attachment style. There's a theory of attachment styles that started with Bowlby and there were others later. Uh, and most narcissists have what is known as insecure attachment style. Uh, most, in most cases, dismissive avoidant attachment style. But attachment style can, can be typical of a totally healthy person. Attachment style is when you experience a certain type of relationship with parental figures, peers, role models in early childhood, and you created something known as the internal working model. The internal working model is a model in your mind that tells you how relationships should look. And then you behave in relationships according to the internal working model. It has nothing to do with narcissism. It so happens that narcissists are dismissive avoidant because they need to reenact the early childhood trauma. But it's not like with healthy people. Healthy people are dismissive, avoidant, or insecure because they were never exposed to a good relationship in their family of origin. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, how come narcissists and psychopaths get trauma bonded by their partners? I'm sorry, you have to... Uh, how narcissists and psychopaths get trauma bonded by their partners? They don't get trauma bonded, but they trauma bond. They trauma bond the partner. I thought I explained it. They trauma bond by behaving unpredictably. Because they behave unpredictably, hot and cold, and, and I love you, I hate you, and so on. They create a dependency on the source of the behavior. Uh, I understood that part, but ah. I don't understand how, uh, how do they go through that process? The, through the emotions? Because they, they can discard at the beginning. You're not my mom. And they can discard it, but how, they can't discard, they can't discard just a person. The narcissist needs, the, the, the narcissist needs to discard a mother. He, does, he cannot discard just anyone. He needs to discard a mother figure. So to become a mother figure, he needs first to idealize you. He must go through this. This is an inexorable mechanism, process, conveyor belt. He cannot exit this. He is compelled that's why we call it repetition, compulsion. He is compelled to go through these stages. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One. A million relationships. All of them identical. He has to go through this. He cannot just be with you and then say, okay, I discard you. You're not interesting. Or he cannot devalue you from the beginning. He has to idealize you in order to devalue you. So he is a prisoner. He's a prisoner of what is known as a schema. He's a prisoner of a scheme. And he must reenact it all the time. It's like a hamster. You know what is a hamster? Yeah. On a wheel? It's a hamster on the wheel. That's a narcissist. I hope I understood your question. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was thinking, regarding the choice uh, to be in a relationship with a narcissist. And uh, to explain this, if I understood you correctly, as a Mutual gratification, intermittent uh, supplier. I, I don't know okay. what was the expression. But then, uh, since no choice is accidental, unconsciously we choose uh, people uh, with whom we want to be in a relationship. But let's put it aside. It made me think that practically <coughs> The ones who choose to be in a relationship with a narcissist are themselves also uh, narcissists, in a way. No, not narcissists, but they have, um, they definitely, they have some potential. They have some problems. They, they definitely have, for example, a deficit in self-love, these people. They would, have, uh, they would have a mismanagement of the self-love economy. They are either unable to love themselves except through the agency of someone else, 
So they can love this, themselves only through someone else's gaze. Or they have what we call an internalized bad object. Internalized bad object used to be known as primitive superego. Internalized bad object is a set of voices, internal voices, that tell you that you're unworthy, you're bad, you're inadequate, you're ugly, you're stupid. These are internal voices. So when you come across someone who is telling you exactly the opposite, it's addictive. So many of them have internalized bad object. Um, some of them are narcissists, it's true. But I think the vast majority are more likely to be borderlines, codependents, um, or have a deficit in self-love, or something like that. Uh, attachment styles, which are problematic, like insecure attachment style, and so on. I think we should focus more on this, uh, rather than narcissism. Yes, please. Two questions. Two questions? I'll give you a discount. Yeah. <laughs> I have a problem with hearing, so I'll come near you. When he enters a relationship, yeah? Uh, he uh, tests the mother with yeah. abusive behavior. Don't you think uh, that maybe he's doing the same with all the relationships? Yes. With friends, yes. with employees. With yes, yes, yes. I said that I give intimate relationship, romantic relationship, as example. Mm -hmm. But all interpersonal relationships are identical. They all involve shared fantasy. Okay, and my second question is, uh, what do you think about the mothers, the mothers in the workplace? The people who are doing mobbing, uh, do they have narcissistic uh, parts? Uh, the, the lady asked about uh, mobbing, mobbing in the workplace. Uh, another phenomenon is gang stalking and so on. Ironically, the few studies on mobbing and gang stalking fail to find um, a preponderance of personality disorders in these groups. However, starting in 2020, as I mentioned, uh, studies by Gabay, if you're interested to read online, studies by Gabay and others in British Columbia as well, China and so on. Gabay conducted four studies in Israel, of all places, <laughs> before, before October 7th, on, in 2020. She conducted four studies. And they, they found that narcissists and psychopaths are much more likely to be found in victimhood movements than in aggressive movements. They, they, they studied aggression versus victimhood. And they found that in aggressive movements, so these would be gangs, for example, street gangs. There are many studies on, on narcissism in street gangs. These would be paramilitary formations and militias. These would be uh, supremacists, Ku Klux Klan, these kind of people. Uh, they fail to find. Uh, an incidence of narcissism and psychopathy, uh, in, uh, narcissism, sorry, incidence of narcissism that is higher than the general population. They did find a higher incidence of psychopathy in these groups, but it was lower than the level of psychopathy among chief executive officers of big companies in the United States. I'm not kidding. These are studies by Hare, Robert Hare and Babiak. Hare and Babiak studies. So, psychopa psychopaths gravitate not so much to violence. We have this image of psychopath as someone with a knife, you know, stalking, killing, killing people, women mostly, serial killer, rapists. Uh, they, th these are not psychopaths. I mean, some of them are psychopaths, but that's not, that's a stereotype. The overwhelming vast majority of psychopaths uh, appear to be normal. There was a, a scholar by the name of Hervey Cleckley. And Hervey Cleckley wrote a stunning masterpiece. Uh, it's titled The Mask of Sanity. The Mask of Sanity. It's available free online. You can download it. And in The Mask of Sanity, he makes, he makes a claim that psychopaths are wearing, wearing the mask of sanity. They appear to be sane. They appear to be completely normal, but they're mentally ill. That's Cleckley's view. It's not my view, but... And he's right about the first part. The overwhelming vast majority of psychopaths are neighbors next door, your colleagues, your friends, your... That's the overwhelming vast majority. Uh, Malta, Malta Stout wrote a book called The Sociopath Next Door about, the, about this phenomenon. And so these psychopaths gravitate to the top. They end up being top doctors, 
top uh, chief executive officers, top politicians, top. They, they reached the top. Uh, there were studies that the incidence of, psycho of severe psychopathy among surgeons, medical doctors who are surgeons, is much higher than the general population. No offense, Bogo. No, I yeah, of course, <laughs> no man. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I apologize. Sir. You are the only exception. Only exception. With my stamp of authority, you're the exception. So, but it's a fact that among surgeons, actually, the, the world's most famous psychopath is a neurosurgeon, James Fallon. He's the most famous psychopath. So, I think we are confusing psychopaths with narcissists because they are both aggressive. Both types are aggressive, both types are obnoxious, both types are, want something from us, both, both parties are Machiavellian, Machiavellian means manipulative, and so we say the same, they're not the same, of course completely not the same. Psychopaths are goal oriented, there's money, they're there, there's power, they're there. It could be power over life, that's in the medical profession, it could be power over people, politics, it could be power over company. They're power, they're power hungry. That's why, for example, the incidence of rape among psychopaths is much higher than among narcissists. The Nazis don't care about power, that's the irony. When you read online, when you read online and so on and so forth, uh, all these self-styled experts and journalists that don't know quite what they're talking about, they say that narcissists want power, they want money, they want, no, these are psychopaths. Narcissists, Narcissus wants attention. Because when the narcissist becomes rich, he gets attention. So that's why he becomes rich. It's means to an end. When the narcissist becomes powerful, president of the United States, he gets attention. So it's about attention, whereas the psychopath avoids attention. Psychopath is exactly the opposite. Could, psychopath doesn't care less what you think and what you don't think. As far as the psychopath is concerned, your old instruments, your old tools, your old objects. He moves you around like in chess, you know. He couldn't care less what you say or you don't say if you notice. And most psychopaths like to fly under the radar. They like to not attract attention. And if they attract attention, it's not like psychopaths. They will attract attention like, you know, pillars of the community and so on. Now, it's a very, the question raised an issue that I did not mention. Listen, I've been doing this for 30 years. So the lecture would be um, 30 hours, if you want to try to compress it. No, but seriously, there are so many topics and subtopics and I can talk forever. And I do talk forever, I have a YouTube channel. But one last, uh, one last thing about your, your question. There is a variant of narcissist, a type of narcissist, is known as the pro-social or communal narcissist. That is a narcissist who is very proud that he is moralistic, that he is ethical that is altruistic, that is charitable, he gives to charity, that is a saint. So, I don't know, someone like Madre Teresa maybe, you know, they are proud of being good, good people, but their goodness is performative, it's a performance, it's a show. They're ostentatious. If they give you charity, there will be a camera there documenting the charity. If they're being good, there will be a newspaper article tomorrow. And they are all the time moral. They are the, the standard of morality, you know. So this, this, this is a type of narcissist that is deceiving people, misleading people. Many gurus, many saints, many priests. In religion, this is very common. Many such people are actually narcissists. And their grandiosity is in how good they are. They reject the bad object, because all narcissists have a bad object. And they say, I don't have an internalized bad object because I'm a good person. I'm a good object. But of course, there's nothing there. It's an absence, all the same. It's performance. I would say that narcissism is performative. Exactly like gender, by the way. When we say men, woman, it's a performance. There's no, there's no biological foundation to men, woman. There's a lot of biological foundation for male, female. Male and female, of course. They're biologically determined. To some extent. But men-woman is not biologically determined. It's a social, cultural construct. 
and we are performing the role. From very small age, we are taught how to be a man, and we are told how to be a woman, and we are playing these roles all, all our lives. Same with narcissism. Same with narcissism. They play a role. It's a role play. It's a performance. It's all a giant theater, like Shakespeare said. You know, it's a stage. But when you go behind the scenes, there's nothing. Nothing behind the scenes. Not even dressing rooms. Not even a mirror. Nothing. When you go behind the scenes, you fall off the edge of the earth. There's deep space behind the scenes. So even the theater is fake. Even the theater is fake. Because there's no back, backstage. You know. It's all fake. Completely. It's all... Audience. audience. Yes, it's attention seeking. And, and nothing will stop the narcissist to obtain attention. He will be what you want him to be. At any, at any minute, at any environment, at any circumstance. It's all fake. Completely. It's all... Audience. Yes, it's attention seeking. And, and nothing will stop the narcissist to obtain attention. He will be what you want him to be. At any, at any minute, at any environment, at any circumstance. By the way, those of you who want to go... Unfortunately, we can't see this on MRI. <laughs> Yet. 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 But I trust you. Thank you for coming. Thank you.